This week on Motor Week, Toyota claims a major breakthrough with their Starlet replacement. Jenny Buckley goes on an adventure of a lifetime to drive with the Chrysler Jeep team at the French 4x4 event called the Quasium Blanche. But first, Mr. Chris Goffey and the new Avant. It's almost 20 years since the first Audi Avant appeared. A five-door version of the 100 and 200 models that somehow managed to avoid the tacked-on estate car back end of an existing saloon. And that's a tradition that's been maintained up to the present day. The Avant is still an integrated styling approach, a model in its own right. Now this is the latest in the line, the A6 Avant goes on sale this spring. The old model was a, a real load carrier. It had a, a long rear overhang behind the rear wheels, a lot of space. This car is in effect no longer than the saloon version, but there's still an awful lot of space. It's exceptionally well trimmed. It's hardly the car for a, a Welsh sheep farmer, far too svelte for that. You get a, a load cover to keep your valuables away from prying eyes and these excellent load nets that make sure that loose items in the back don't catch you in the back of the neck in an emergency. And it's fitted with roof rails for the mountain bikes, the windsurfers and the hang gliders, the sort of thing that Audi would have you associate with the image of this car. Well, I mean, you have versatility, of, obviously, of a split folding seat, a uh, net partition as well. Um, in the future, and we're talking about autumn, end of the year, there will be a special bike carrying system, low carrying system, where it will actually slide out on a flat floor and there will be ret retainers to accommodate mountain bikes. Obviously on the roof, even now, you can have a complete roof carrying system for anything from surfboards to mountain bikes. There's even a bike lift that hydraulically will lift the bike onto the roof and then you just have to clip it into place. So, yeah, it will accommodate a huge range of uh, leisure pursuits. Inside beautifully trimmed as you'd expect for a car in the executive class. Airbags poised to explode at you from every side. There's one in each door as well as the passenger and driver's side. Interestingly only one cup holder. What's the driver supposed to do if his passenger's drinking a coke? Climate control as standard. You can adjust the temperature for both passenger and driver's side and all the executive toys you'd expect, which multiply as you go up the price range from 24 to 31,000 pounds. No surprises in the Audi on the move. We've come to expect easy to drive, smooth and relatively quiet cars. The Avant is no exception, although a bit more perhaps tire noise than you'd get in the saloon. And that's due to these cavernous spaces behind the driver. Driver position is very good, you can adjust the steering wheel, there's electric control of seat height as standard and not an extra, and uh, the seats to use the dreadful old cliché, supportive. Sophisticated in-car entertainment as standard, but I'm very disappointed to find that there's no controls for the radio up here on the steering wheel. My pet fear is always looking down to fumble with the radio and look up just in time to have ERF engraved on your forehead. Nicely laid out instrument panel and great big dials for speedo and rev counter. That's useful as uh, the driving population gets over the age of 50 and their close-up eyesight starts to fail. Germans have always gone for uniformly black interiors and uh, research said it made people feel depressed after a while. They're starting to change a bit, little elements of grey here and there, and the, the roof lining is light grey, but there's an awful lot of black still in here. An excellent feature is the Oddman stowage in the bottom of the door panel here with these locking lids. Excellent idea, lots of capacity, and it means things don't fall about when you put them in there. Road surfaces around here in deeper Surrey, not particularly good. Obviously, the county council is short of road repair budget, and the Audi does tend to pitch around a bit on the bumps and thumps. It'll be interesting to see what it's like with the full permitted load in the back. The ride is good, but um, personally not as good as, uh, for instance, the 5 Series Touring, which is the obvious competitor. And not content with simple old anti-lock brakes. 
This car also gets electronic brake force distribution and electronic differential lock and anti-skid regulator traction control. In other words, Audi are determined you're not going to play the lunatic in their car. The Avant gets the same complicated spread of engines that Audi insist on offering. The 1.8 turbo, the 2.4 V6, a 2.8 V6, and later on a 2.7 twin turbocharger, high performance version. In addition, there's two diesel engines. It must be the part manager's nightmare. And you can have front wheel drive, four wheel drive, five speed manual, six speed manual, or a five speed automatic. Pays you money takes your choice. The way we look at it is we offer a very wide engine spread to cover all budgets, all tastes, from an entry level 1.9 TDI with very good fuel economy, right up to a 2.8 Quattro four-wheel drive, 193 horsepower, and a good solid mix of V6s in the middle, offering lots of torque and engine flexibility. Which do you think is going to be the most popular? We would predict the 2.4 V6, that's where we see the centre of gravity, moving up 165 horsepower, a lot of torque. The V6 TDI, which is uh, very new for Audi, first V6 diesel we've ever offered, that should prove very popular as well. Indeed, that has more torque than the 2.8 petrol, which is quite phenomenal. So uh, uh, diesel is going to be an important segment to you? Oh, for sure. And historically, we've outperformed other manufacturers. Direct injection, you know, they're very quiet phenomenal fuel economy for big cars. I mean, the 1.9 TDI offers fuel economy that you know, maybe an Astra or a compact car offers, yet you have all the style and added safety of a big car. And the V6, as I say, has more torque than the petrol. It's an indication of Audi's attention to detail that the stylists were not happy with the saloon car's windscreen and A pillars. They didn't quite blend with the shape of the event. So at enormous cost on the production line, this car has different more steeply raked pillars and a completely different windscreen. Audi have been looking for a more dynamic image for a younger customer base over the last five years and the plan seems to be working. As one manager said to me not so long ago, it's been like launching a new franchise. When Toyota wanted to create a new replacement for the lacklustre Starlet, they realised that they had to do something very different. Starting with a blank sheet of paper, they decided to work inside out, starting with a roomy, safe interior shape with factors that were ergonomic to most sizes of people. Then they wrapped a body with quite a revolutionary style around this area. The result we'll see on UK streets soon. They call it, and don't snigger now, the Yaris. The name may sound like a rejected word from a Scrabble party, but mark our words, the Yaris will make a big impression in the small car sector. Motorweek was there at Geneva last month when journalists first saw the Yaris emerging. The noise of jaws dropping on the floor was deafening. This is a totally new car, not just an adaptation of an existing one. We wanted to create the best small car for the European user not just the affluent ones. We wanted to make it as comfortable as possible, giving the people the room that they need, and also as practical as possible, because of the ever-increasing restrictions in the urban environment. This is the result. A car that's big inside and small outside. It is higher and wider to accommodate people with their luggage better. It is shorter in length with an increased wheelbase to ensure that it is easy to manoeuvre, very stable and grips well the road. Maturity has been the key word for design in order to achieve properties of a higher class car. We wanted to create a new benchmark for a small car. I think we have done it. Every part of car design was questioned. Nothing was taken for granted. Teams of engineers sat around all day with their coffees and sake trying to answer questions like exactly how do people get in and out of cars? How do they sit in it? How do they live in it? This car may not look revolutionary, but it is. 
We kept the exterior design fairly restrained. But when you look inside, you can see how innovative it is. The engineers were encouraged to question every basic relationship in the car and come up with improvements that would benefit driver and passengers. For a start, we increased the cabin height but kept the floor level low. We've given the new small car a low center of gravity, yet increased space where people need it. Up here, for their heads. Toyota say if you don't think it looks revolutionary, wait till you sit in it and drive it. We'll report on this as soon as we get the opportunity. One thing we can see from these pictures, the Yaris is bristling with high technology, with advanced variable valve timing, navigation systems, and not forgetting the new Toyota 1-litre engine, which they claim bring higher standards in performance, economy, and emissions. The offset crankshaft means there's a reduction in piston friction. Toyota's single-coil direct injection optimizes combustion, and every part of the design has aimed at reducing engine weight. The new 1-litre engine will offer a flat torque curve from low revs and a maximum output of about 50 kilowatts. The styling of the dash and controls, well weird, it makes the Ford car's interior look almost normal. Curves and swooping lines are pleasant on the eye, yet look at first glance to be fairly practical. As we say, we'll report more on the Yaris when we get a chance to drive it. After the break, we travel to the French Alps for our exclusive report on the Croisière Blanche 4x4 event. Most people come to the breathtaking French Alps to ski down them. But here in the village of Merlet, I've discovered a few hundred madmen who have thrown away their skis and decided to drive down the Alps instead. Yes, every January, a couple of hundred 4x4 vehicles of every description converge on this tiny mountain village to spend three days and one gruelling night, getting to grips with some serious off-roading. The event is now into its 21st year, and it's a curious, non-competitive affair called the Croisière Blanche. It's an event for the slightly crazy, people who are at their happiest when faced with the toughest terrain, forcing them to take their vehicles to the limit and beyond. I joined in the madness with a contingent from Jeep UK, headed up by the amazingly calm off-road guru Barry Stallard and Chris Bashel, who specialises in turning 4x4 vehicles into off-road monsters, capable even in the hands of a novice like me. If you are going to be crazy enough to drive through parts of the Alps that even the skiers won't entertain, then it's probably not a bad idea to be doing it in one of these. I'm talking, of course, about the grandson of the original World War II Willis Jeep. This is the rough and tumble Wrangler, and it ain't any old Wrangler, it's a specially prepared Rubicon Wrangler, and it's guaranteed to get you out of a fix. And I have a feeling that I'll be getting myself into my fair share of them. The Rubicon is a special conversion named after the Rubicon Trail, one of the toughest off-road events in the States. Barry came up with some ideas of what he wanted his standard four-litre Jeep to be able to do and Chris Bashel from Surrey Off-Road came up with the ways to do it. So basically this vehicle was at the NEC Motor Show, gleaming on the stand there. We've taken it, Barry wanted to put bigger tyres on, which meant we had to lift the suspension and the body. So she's now running three inches more suspension, an inch more body. Uh, we've lowered the ratio in the diffs, we've put locking diffs front and rear. It has two inches, one at the front, one at the back. We've had a custom build all the winch bumpers and all the running gear for it. So you've got a hell of a lot of kit on there, really. Does it make it very expensive? Yeah, some stuff there which is probably a little over the top. But uh, you've got a vehicle there that you can cruise on the motorway at 90 mile an hour if you wanted to, comfortably all day long. And when you get to the other end, you can go out there and mix it with the, with the top guys. Well, with wheels like that, I really couldn't fail. But first, I had to master the art of the snow chain, chain. and cope with a very top. early start. Yeah. 
I soon got the hang of it and we were off in a convoy to navigate the first of three extremely difficult technical routes that promised to take us up ski slopes, down perilous mountain passes and over makeshift bridges. But before we could even get to the serious stuff, disaster struck. An over-enthusiastic Frenchman at the front of our convoy had got himself stuck and was promptly followed by another one. Of course, the trouble with off-roading in conditions like this is that one minute you can be sitting snug and comfortable inside your vehicle, powering your way through the snow, admiring the scenery. And then somebody, several cars in front, decides to get stuck. And you have to wait around for an hour and a half while they winch and dig them out. The thing about this event is that there are points for team spirit and for helping your fellow off-roaders. So I suppose, really, I should go and do my bit, shouldn't I? In this event, there are no prizes for finishing first. Points are awarded for understanding the road book, which is in French, for off-road ability, and yes, for your helpfulness in digging the other vehicle out of the immense snowdrifts. But digging didn't seem to be enough to get this one out. Luckily for them, the Rubicon is equipped to handle just about anything. Chris to the rescue. And so at last it was time for some real fun. Britons to enter this event were David and Audrey Davenport, serious off-roaders for more than 20 years. It's a wonderful feeling to get so many people out here all smiling in the snow and uh, bragging about their exploits and uh, the, 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 the talk and the crack at the uh, meals in the evening is, is unbelievable because they're talking about you know these military vehicles they've towed out of the ditch and buses they've pulled out of the hedgerows and uh, it's just the excitement of it all to see people who've never done it before. So uh, thrilled with uh, what they've done and the achievement. You'd think they'd, uh, you know, they'd won a Grand Prix the way they're talking, some of them. <laughs> Audrey, would you like to see more British people out here? Is that what you're hoping to do? Um, I think David would, certainly. But we, we would like it better if they were more mixed in with the French people like we were when we first started doing it, you know. Um, and I think they'd get more out of it if they could, you know, not necessarily talk the language, but, you know, know a few words and, and try and mix with the French people. It's not easy. In a village like this, it, at the moment, appears absolutely deserted. You wonder where the people are. But the odd people that you do see wandering around in the snow, they all wave. Nobody's shaking their fist at us. In terms of the mixture of the French and the English, I would like to see more English people here. But already I'm making a, attempts to mix the people up more. I'm limiting the numbers in some of the small hotels for next year so that we actually share around and people are forced you know, to mingle a little bit more the way we had to when we first started doing these. David reckons that around £1,800 will cover two of you for transport, accommodation, food and entry fees. Of course, that doesn't cover the cost of repairs to your vehicle if you have a tendency to investigate ditches. You'll also need to invest in some heavy-duty snow chains, which will quickly becoming a real pain. A lot of duties of off-roading. <laughs> But snow chains on, it's amazing what even a novice like me can get a standard four-litre Wrangler to do. For three exhilarating days, I had an absolute ball. And although I didn't get any prizes on the final night, Mundy Noakes of Starbridge displayed plenty of girl power by picking up a second prize for her driving skills for generally being a true good Samaritan. Mandy, congratulations. You've done a coup, not just for Britain, but also for the women out there as well. Second prize in the whole of the Cosier Blanche. I mean, that's incredible. How do you feel? Absolutely tremendous, wonderful experience, and I'm just over the moon. Can't really believe it at the moment, but just incredible. What makes it more incredible is that this is, what, is this your first event, or are you an old hand at this? You tell us. No, it's my first major event, so it's extra special for that. What about your driving history? Have you done a lot of off-roading in the past? Not a tremendous amount of off-roading. I've done driven Land Rovers for quite a long time and just messed around with them really, doing like fun days and little events and off-roading in Wales. So this is the first big competition. What do you think's clinched it for you? What's clinched it? 
spirit, just going for it, really putting the vehicle through its pace and just being out there and being at one with the vehicle really. There's nowhere in England you can drive in snow like this with this sort of scenery. Um, ice driving, snow driving is a particular skill and you've got to learn it. I've, I've had to learn it. I've never driven in conditions like this before. Um, and it's a challenge of being able to say, I've driven that and come through and the vehicle's not damaged and you're not, you know, it just puts a big smile on your face. What were you looking for in the vehicles that you brought out? Um, well, all our vehicles, you, you've got to be able to do long distances on the road in them and then still compete with the best that the world can offer when you get to an event like this. And I think we've done exactly that. Are you pleased with how they've performed over the last couple well, of days? Well, when you end up pulling a French armoured car out of the snow, you've got to say you've arrived, haven't you? <laughs> you I'd pay money to come back. Why? Ah, oh, it's just the atmosphere is just brilliant. The location's brilliant. The people are friendly. You don't get any aggravation from the locals. They're pleased to see you. You're bringing money into the area. Um, and the whole event has got a real, real atmosphere. It's very difficult to describe unless you've actually been involved in it. Well, that's my visit to the 21st Croisian Blanche over with. And I think I'm off to indulge in a bit of skiing that I have to say now looks incredibly dull and boring and simple. You know, it's been a very demanding but very exciting three days and it's quite comforting to realise that the Englishmen are no longer the total mad idiots in Europe. I think the French have overtaken us on that score. So come on, all you 4 by 4 owners, give those vehicles a break from shopping at Sainsbury's in the school run. Invest in some decent tyres, a set of snow chains and get yourselves out here next year to show the Europeans just what the British can do. I'll be there. See you then. If you'd like to join the UK contingent at next year's Croisier Blanche, send a stamped addressed envelope to David Davenport, Copsland, Woodland Avenue, Cranley, GU6 7HU. Next week, Ginny's back on firmer ground, testing the Volvo V70 all-wheel drive. Is it worth a 30000 plus price tag? And Citroen are featured with their frontier-breaking Dynauto engine system, which is claimed to deliver a 20% improvement in economy and emissions. Next week, on Motor Week.